and thank you for tuning in to this presentation all about the pollination project application and how to be successful. My name is Claire Rooney and I am the Scottish officer for the pollination project and part of a bigger team. If you have any questions, you can contact the pollination team at the email address dis displayed on the screen. So I'm going to start by inspiring you as to what a pollination school ground could possibly look like. So this presentation aims to inspire you by showcasing the scope of possible developments which can support pollinating species. We look at the very basic low budget options to more groundbreaking opportunities which can support landscape scale conservation. Remember, every school ground has the potential to attract more pollinating species. You will need to consider certain things. So bear in mind the context of your own site, how much grass versus tarmac is available for redevelopment. What's the underlying soil type in your area? What's the surface? What's the lay of the land? What types of habitats do your school grounds link to? Which areas receive sunshine and at what times in the day? And have you already observed poll pollinating species in and around your grounds? You'll also need to think about the different needs of pollinating insects. Classically, we think to provide them with diet of pollen and nectar from flowers and trees, but they also need places to nest and shelter. So different species require different vegetation types and structure at different points in their life cycle. So the bigger the mosaic of habitats you can offer, including hedgerows and grass margins and bare ground, then the more biodiversity you will attract. So this presentation looks at a range of developments which you could implement and for simplicity each slide will follow this format and the parameters are expressed in this key. So we look at the cost as in is it easily achievable on a shoestring, is it a moderate cost or is it more of an investment i.e. more than £500. In terms of difficulty we we'll look at can the activities be done by pupils themselves? Does it require support from the local community, other volunteers, or perhaps specialist skills will be needed? In terms of maintenance, we look at what you would need to do on an annual basis and whether that will be low input or high input. The establishment time is basically the time taken to witness the changes that you put into place and the benefits are in terms of the benefits for pollinating species. Are you providing foraging habitat, nesting or shelter? So even if you only have a small stretch of tarmac, then you can certainly still make more space for pollinators. You could start by putting in some artificial pollinator homes. For example, a bug hotel can be used to attract a wide range of invertebrates. The basic framework is just wooden pallets. It can actually be made from a whole range of recycled, reclaimed materials. For the, for the greatest biodiversity, you want to site it somewhere so that it receives some sunshine, but some shade as well on a level, even surface. And be sure for this project that you're incorporating suitable nesting habitat for pollinators, such as drilled holes in blocks of wood, hollow stems, and straw or hay. Each spring queen bumblebees are searching for a site to build a nest and establish a new colony so we can help them there by improvised nests, uh, digging a hole, putting some bedding material in the bottom and covering it with a slab. In fact an old teapot full of bedding materials such as moss or dry grass would be ideal. Not all bees are social, so to attract solitary bees you can fashion nests out of 8 inch lengths of bamboo cane or perhaps native hollow stems. 
bundle them together within a cylindrical structure and hang them in a south-facing position and watch the bees move in. So perhaps um, your horizontal space is at a premium, then what's to stop you planting vertically? You can look at an, an all-out, all-singing, all-dancing green wall or take a more low-tech option of planting vertically, such as planting into wall hangings, upturned pallets, suspended plastic bottles, etc. You can attach these to railings, fences, or the school wall, and consider them to have similar maintenance to hanging baskets. If you are inspired by having an actual green wall, this approach really does require substantial investment and commitment. It's a pretty striking art architectural feature, but it will also be valuable foraging habitat, particularly for urban pollinating species, if there isn't much green on the ground. There are currently several research projects into the overall effectiveness of green walls, which reach beyond just being foraging habitat. So it would be an inter interesting direction to go in. Um, a green wall is quite complex. It's specially designed panels and an integrated irrigation system. So you'd need to bear this in mind. There will be the costs of running a pump, the annual maintenance, and staff would require training in how to care for the wall as well. So maybe your school has more green space available, which could be better serving pollinators. The classic pollinator habitat that springs to people's mind has to be a wildflower meadow. Once established, a meadow is a low maintenance, high impact method of increasing biodiversity in your school grounds. And even if your grounds have limited green space available, then you could have potted, man potted meadows if you used a range of planters such as old tyres and sowed meadow seed into there. Each year the seeds can be harvested for selling or enhancing your existing sward, so it's also an I ideal context for learning for sustainability. If done thoughtfully, it's an excellent source of nectar and pollen for a variety of for foraging pollinating insects and it can accommodate them from spring through to autumn. So when selecting species to, pl to plant, take into account things like your soil type, what time do the different species you're choosing flower at, what are the flowers different shapes, are they different heights, and what are the plants already growing in your locality. Please be aware as well, though, that a meadow should be provided in conjunction with suitable habitat for nesting and sheltering, which we'll cover. So an orchard is actually a priority habitat under the UK government's biodiversity action plan. And an orchard is considered anything from five or more fruit trees. It can be a great refuge for nature. So think not only of having your fruit trees, but perhaps a protective hedge around the orchard using native species there. You can leave the grass uncut to allow flowering and seed set, perhaps to have a forest garden incorporated within the orchard. So the growing of herbs and soft fruits as well. Avoid the use of chemicals on the crop and even integrate other simple wildlife features such as a solitary bee home. If you are interested in having an orchard, then the Orchard Network, www.orchardnetwork.org.uk, can give you further support and advice and link you with an orchard group local to you. So a beehive is a, another possibility for increasing pollinating, pollinating insects in your grounds. Perhaps rather than running a hive yourselves, you could offer your space to an experienced beekeeper. beekeeper. The British Beekeeping Association, bbka.org.uk, may be able to match you up with a local contact if you head to their map pages. A bee he beehive can be a great real-world lear learning resource, particularly for science investigations and data handling opportunities. 
if you do own the hive as well, then there's the opportunity to learn about enterprise and sustainability, uh, looking at the honey produced and the sale of that. However, it's important to remember that honeybees are just one species of bee. There are more than 250 species of bee across the UK. The other species are bumblebees and solitary bees. And we haven't even mentioned all the other non-bee pollinating insects. The Pollination Project aspires to increase all pollinating insect biodiversity. So even if you do decide to establish a hive, then please don't forget about the other pollinating species as well. So hedgerows are a great example of something that can be both functional and beneficial if done thoughtfully. A species rich hedgerow is one that has a mix of species with varied fruit, flowers and foliage throughout the season. And a hedge generally comprises around five plants per meter. You'll need to consider what type of hedge you want. For example, does it actually need to be stock proof? Well, child proof in your situation. Or perhaps you want something that's more playable, maybe even edible. In general, hawthorn is um, to take up three quarters of a traditional native hedgerow. But given that it's quite a spiky species, you may opt for something like hazel. In amongst the trees, then you could plant other species such as bramble, elder, honeysuckle, ivy, and dog roads. So ivy is particularly important. Many bees rely upon this species for the majority of the pollen and nectar that they collect during the autumn months. Uh, this is a crucial time when the insects are trying to build up stores for the winter and to feed their young. Honeysuckle, this is a great night scented species for attracting nocturnal pollinators such as moth species. Uh, whereas bramble, wildflower and el uh, wild rose and elder are all good both for foraging and for nesting opportunities because they produce hollow stems. When your hedge is established, you can even consider adding plug plants of native woodland edge flower, floral species, and this will enable further foraging opportunity. You can even let the grass grow long beneath the hedge, and this is nesting potential. So you may be a fortunate school and have extensive grounds full of potential, in which case it's relatively straightforward to designate a patch as rough grassland. So as long as you can give over a grass margin at least two meters wide, you can easily cultivate this to establish a tussock structure. It's even better if your rough grassland is sited next to a hedge or some scrubland or woodland or a watercourse. And you can even introduce native grass species quite cheaply to further encourage the formation of tussocks. So the maintenance is the, the key thing to consider if you are looking at having a rough grassland area, basically leaving it alone. But this needs to be communicated to your external land services. From the third year onwards, then you'll be looking at rotational mowing and leaving certain areas uncut. So really a clear, well-communicated long-term maintenance plan will be key to the success of rough grassland. A south-facing slope with bare ground. So if you've got an existing south-facing slope, then the costs are ne really negligible to create some bare ground patches. Simply, it's simply a case of removing some of the turf to expose open earth, which has a vertical profile, and then just maintaining this as bare ground. This will work better if you're on acidic or neutral soils, and it provides key nesting habitat for our mining bee species. If your school grounds are situated where the geology is chalk or limestone, and you've got a south-facing slope, then potentially you could have the opportunity to restore this land to chalk grassland. This is an exceptionally valuable species rich habitat 
particularly prevalent where it's warmer and drier in the south and east of England. And it's ideal because no individual plant species can outcompete each other. So this leads to a wealth of foraging, pollinating insect life. And the maintenance is quite basic, just an annual strim, removing the arisings. And some schools have done this previously, and they've incorporated annual sheep grazing. So yes, you can create the greatest pollinator habitat ever in your school grounds, and hopefully, hopefully you are inspired. But if it is offered in isolation, you are unlikely to have a large number of pollinating species and any populations that you do have may not be robust enough to survive in the long term. For that reason, it's important that you consider the habitat surrounding your school grounds, the species already there, and how you can reach out and link your grounds to these areas. So hopefully you are inspired by the Pollination Dream School. Obviously, we don't anticipate that your school grounds will be exactly like that, but it should give you some food for thought. We're going to turn now to look at the application form itself to see how you can give yourselves the best chance of being successful within the application process. So just for information to let you know what the pollination project offers, all school clusters, the successful schools this is, will receive networking events and a series of progressive workshops, um, all delivered by a dedicated, highly trained facilitator who will support them through the process of making these long-term grounds changes. There is a £4,000 grant available to each cluster. It's likely that the lead school will get a larger proportion of this. Any secondary school at all, not necessarily a shortlisted one, can apply to grow wild for wildflower seed. And all schools will have access to a fantastic new web resource basically a hub for pollination activities and guidance. Again, all interested parties can participate in a new opal pollinating species survey. And the pollination process provides an ideal context for completing other awards, such as the John Muir Award or the Duke of Edinburgh Award, or attaining your green flag status with eco schools. So <clears throat> the, uh, the journey through the project is really punctuated by a series of workshops, starting with an introduction, then time to do survey work, baseline survey work, looking at making changes and exploring the grounds, and then how to progress those changes and develop things further and culminating in a big survey in the final year of the project to find out what difference you've made. So um, just to let you know, at this point in time, we're hosting webinars to give people further information and an online detailed application form will be available for all schools to submit and the closing date for this is the 31st of October and by January 2016 is when we will have notified all successful school clusters. So as mentioned it is a cluster approach that is being adopted. This is just a screen grab of how the application form is likely to appear and the cluster approach has been decided upon to encourage joined up thinking within communities and um, schools so that we're best serving the environment and enabling the continuation of pupils learning as they move through the education system. So as you can see here, the ideal scenario is a lead secondary school with three feeder primaries 
but that's not to say we won't consider applications from alternative institutions as we're definitely keen to hear about new innovative approaches although be aware this may involve further tailoring from yourselves as practitioners if you fall outside of the general target audience for example, we, we are having an OPAL survey which is designed for upper primary and secondary pupils. So within your cluster, you will definitely need some secondary school input for the peer-to-peer -peer benefits. These are the success criteria to which you will be ass assessed. And it's important to note that within your applications at this point in time, we're not looking for detailed grounds plans. The above criteria are much more central to the decision making process and the success of your grounds in the long run. So commitment. How will you prove commitment? So we're looking for evidence that you've been actively engaged throughout the application process. Have you integrated the pollination project into your whole school planning? How are you going to ensure the long-term sustainability of the changes that you make in this project? How will you fulfill maintenance planning? Have you got a cross-school project team so that the burden of responsibility doesn't fall upon one person's shoulders? Can you show how you are distributing the management of the project? Have you got a commitment to some, some administration time? And can you prove that there is sustainable staff and student engagement on this process? Uh, and in terms of collaboration, there must have already been effective partnership work within your cluster, if you can allude to that. Um, can you give examples of effective work within community groups? and perhaps how you can or already have established links with conservation organizations in your area. In terms of pupil need, this is, this is about uh, more about national statistics, so how your school's, school area ranks amongst national indices of multiple deprivation, and most of the time we should be able to access this information via school postcodes. We will need your input as to what proportion of your school role has identified special educational needs, additional support needs, and specific to England, we will look at um, how pupils qualifying for pupil premium will benefit from the activities, and can you evidence how this may leverage in extra support for your setting? environmental need so we'll look at how you have demonstrated the environmental need for this project in your school and wider community if you've already taken part in recent activity to improve your school grounds environment then we'll look for evidence of that and that will be seen favor favorably are you aware of the local biodiversity priorities, the key species in your area? And have you an awareness of other good environmental practice already going on in your area and possibly how you can link with that? So risk and innovation. As mentioned, we are welcoming creative, innovative applications where clusters can demonstrate making the most of individual circumstances of maybe two or three of the schools within that cluster. So this might lead to novel aspects in terms of design or use of space, funding, community support, or how you'll achieve the ongoing maintenance. We encourage schools who are new to LTL, Grounds for Learning, to get involved. And it's, um, it's important to note, though, that we will need to assess your innovation alongside the risk to the project. Um, barriers to the project's success could be changes in management or um, the non-cooperation of land services or barriers put up if you are a PPI school. So we'll be looking for you to identify these risks to the project and propose levels of mitigation to them. So of course, there are terms and conditions. The, 
HLF is looking for a long-term commitment of participating schools beyond the 2018 life of this project. Please refer to our website and you'll find further details of the specific conditions there which must be met by all of your cluster to be eligible and you can find that there. So that's all from me. I hope that this has inspired you and supported you in the application process, but please, if you require any further assistance, then don't hesitate to get in touch with the pollination team at the email address displayed there, call us, or just check out our website for further information. Thank you.